We've looked at some tips for writing cleaner code, and I've even shown some of my own techniques for structuring games. So now let's take a proper, slightly higher level view of our application and discuss how we can keep our code flexible and more receptible to change. This is not intended as an authoritative or exhaustive list by any means, but rather a collection of small, actionable tips that you can use to immediately improve your code base. So let's first discuss the foundational idea behind several of the tips we'll discuss today, the application hierarchy. Every application, no matter how simple or how complex, has some sort of a hierarchy and this hierarchy needs to be respected. This means that dependencies should only flow down the hierarchy, never up or laterally. Additionally, we generally want to go down only one level for any dependencies. This keeps our code properly decoupled and makes it easy to use various objects around the application wherever we need them since each object is able to work in isolation and has no dependencies on the state or structure of the application beyond its realm of focus. As an example of this principle, let's consider the simplified hierarchy of a small game. If our player is completely isolated and only concerned with what it contains, then we can put our player wherever we want. Other levels, bonus game modes where the game structure is completely different, or even as an interactive way of selecting levels from a menu. But if the player always assumes that it will have a sibling in the tree named items, that immediately breaks this flexibility, as we now have to have an items object in the same level of the player in all locations, whether or not we need it. Not only that, but we've also locked ourselves into the implementation of our sibling and parent dependencies. How much flexibility does our game really have if we always assume that there is an item sibling with coin objects as direct children, and each one has a function called play sound effect? This has nothing to do with the player specifically, but if we change or break this dependency, our player is now broken as well. So that establishes why we don't want to assume structure above or around our object in the tree, but why is going too far down a problem? Well, really for the same reason, assumption of structure and separation of concerns. If our player needs to change animations, it can tell the animation container to do so, but it shouldn't try to manipulate the individual frames of a specific animation, and it definitely shouldn't try to alter the bitmap data itself, as that is way beyond its scope. Keeping things separated means we can change our implementation later without breaking the player code. Maybe we originally used individual images to stitch into an animation and later switch over to a sprite sheet. The player, which should really only be concerned with the overall high-level operation of our character, really doesn't need to know or care how the animation is played, only that it has a way to request animation changes. Which really leads me right into my next point. Generally speaking, we want to keep data and the logic operating on those data together, rather than asking an object for its data so we can operate on them separately. There are exceptions to this rule, of course, such as maybe with some very generic utility functions, but I'm going to keep it more specific to the player, for instance. So revisiting the previous example about the player's relationship to the animation container, the player should tell the animation container the change animations, but not manually access the data within the container and make any required changes, as that moves the logic of changing animations outside of the animation-oriented code and into an object that really shouldn't concern itself with how this transition occurs. Creating a function on the animation container the player can call keeps our animation-related code where it belongs and ensures we can reason about the state of the application at any time, as there are no external effects to be worried about. For example, if an animation isn't playing properly, we know that the issue must be contained within the animation container, not sitting in a random function somewhere else in our application. This also keeps our code reusable and flexible since all the functionality we may need is contained in our animation object. Enemies, NPCs, and the player can all use one consistent interface to manage animations. This rule may seem a bit obvious, but these issues can easily sneak their way into the application when you really just need to make one small change this one time. The previous rules really lead right into this next one. Rather than creating large monolithic objects to get all the functionality you need or going overboard with inheritance, use components to compartmentalize smaller self-sufficient bits of code and compose complex objects out of those components. For instance, there's probably a lot of objects in your game that may have a health bar, the player, various enemies, breakable crates, and so on. Rather than having to manage separate variables and methods on each object to manage health, you could create a health component, or even an entire stats component, that houses and standards the data and functions you need. Now every item in your game that needs a health bar can use this component. Components can massively improve the organization and reusability of your code, and also remove dead code by not having a lot of inheritance you don't need. 
Now let's talk dependency injection, which is the technique of supplying references to objects at runtime rather than compile time. It's a great way to make your code more reusable and flexible because sure, it's easy to say that there's a hierarchy to follow and that certain design patterns can help you maintain that hierarchy, but there are times when you do still need a reference to something that is outside of your direct descendants. State machines come to mind, for instance, since they're generally owned by an object higher in the hierarchy than them, but they need a reference to that parent object so that they can control it. If we hard code this reference, we'll have to duplicate our state machine for every object, which not only is a pain in the butt, but it also breaks the principles of keeping our code dry. With dependency injection, we can instead say that our state will control an object of type X, such as a rigid body, and write our code around that type, but without any specific references to the objects that will hold this state. At runtime, a parent object can pass a reference of itself to the state, and that state will now control that specific object as if it knew about it all along. That's dependency injection in a nutshell. Hopefully you can see just how useful it can be in a lot of different situations, including the previously mentioned technique about compartmentalizing functionality into components. With components and dependency injection, we can write generic code to control movement, health, AI, and more that can flexibly operate on a variety of different objects as needed. So now let's go even higher level and talk about design patterns. And look, I get it. Design patterns aren't the sexiest thing in the world to study, but why bother reinventing the wheel and probably doing a worse job of it when a lot of common issues software developers run into have already been solved? It's worth it to take some time to at least learn the major ones. But I'm not just going to leave it at telling you to go study software architecture, although that's not the worst idea in the world if you've got ambitions for systems-driven games. So here's what I would prioritize. First off, state machines. I've talked about state machines multiple times already, and I could probably squeeze out at least one more video on them if I felt compelled to, so let that be a signal of just how strongly I feel you should be familiar with this pattern. Whether you prefer to use enumerators or more object-oriented code, learn state machines. Even the simplest of games can often benefit from them. Next up, I would learn about the observer pattern. State machines may be my number one pick, but the observer pattern is a very close second that has huge implications for making your code more flexible. With native support in most engines and programming languages, which means you don't even have to put in a lot of time or effort into implementing it, this is arguably the biggest bang for your buck when studying design patterns. After those two patterns, it kind of starts getting into a realm of what do you really need to study to learn about, but the mediator pattern could be a good way to go after the observer pattern. I've not covered this one yet, but it is coming, so I'll just leave it at this. If the observer pattern is too one way for you, this is the pattern you want to study. And as I just mentioned, once you're comfortable with a couple of these patterns, you can start diving into specific issues you're running into, or even just doing a full read of a book like Game Programming Patterns, or maybe a more generic software engineering book, and seeing what sticks out to you. And that's largely it for today, but I do want to leave you with one more important tip. It's okay to be iterative with improving your code style. Don't try to learn every design pattern right away and spend weeks at the start of your next project trying to make your code as perfect as possible before you even fully know what the requirements are or even have the smallest vertical slice possible. Too much theory and not enough practice can just burn you out or even lead to not really understanding the why and how because you've not put it into practice. Plus, let's not forget that a game with mediocre code that ships is better than a perfectly coded game that never does. It is okay to work until you hit a pain point and then research how to fix it. And it can even be worth doing it wrong on a small project, seeing what the final product looked like and what your lessons learned were, and then researching how to do it better in the future since you'll have a better idea of the issues you're going to run into. Remember, both game development and software development as a whole are entire career paths. It takes time to learn how to tackle these problems.